Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's program. My name is Devin Malone, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Today's program, Bringing the Two Doors to the West Coast, offers an in-depth look at the Legion of Honor's presentation of the exhibition, The Two Doors, Art and Majesty in Renaissance England. To share more about today's speakers, Martin Chapman is curator in charge of European decorative arts and sculpture at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. He has organized numerous exhibitions at the Legion of Honor, including Marie Antoinette and the Petit Trianon at Versailles, Houghton Hall, Portrait of an English Country House, and East Meets West, Jewels of the Maharajas from the Al Thani Collection. Thomas Wu is former assistant curator of European decorative arts and sculpture at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. He holds a master's in history of art from the Cotald Institute of Art. Please join me in welcoming Martin and Thomas, and thanks again for attending today's program. Hello, I'm Martin Chapman, curator in charge of European decorative arts and sculpture at the Legion of Honor and curator of the Tudors, Art and Majesty in Renaissance England. And my name is Thomas Wu, and I am the former assistant curator of European decorative arts and sculpture at the Fine Arts Museums and worked closely with Martin on the exhibition. So we're going to uh, uh, do this presentation in three segments. First, an overview, and then a specialist talk by Thomas on cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism in Tudor England. And then we'll uh, have a section on the highlights when the two of us will talk about various highlights in the show. So let's start with an overview. So the Tudors, ambitious, ruthless, passionate, and magnificent. The Tudors are the stars of English history outshining the dynasties that came before and after. Their grip on the public imagination continues to inspire numerous biographies, documentaries, and dramas in the 21st century, including, most recently, the musical Six on Broadway about Henry VIII's wives. During the reigns of the five Tudor monarchs spanning more than 100 years from 1485 to 1603, England evolved from a minor medieval kingdom in a Europe dominated by the Roman Catholic Church to an officially Protestant nation with a distinctive Renaissance culture poised to emerge as a global power. Our present day impressions of the Tudors are largely informed by the splendid art and architecture they left behind. Palaces, rich tapestries and textiles, portraits capturing extravagant costumes, lavish metalwork and jewelry. They all convey a larger than life personalities and a court culture that was intellectual, cosmopolitan and sophisticated. These two iconic portraits are the most of the most recognizable Tudor monarchs, King Henry VIII on the left and Queen Elizabeth I on the right, welcome visitors to our new exhibition, The Tudors, Art and Majesty in Renaissance England. The Legion of Honor is the third and, and final venue for this exhibition, which has originated at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York last winter. Next slide, please. This tutor's exhibition, the first in the United States, features a rich selection of decorative arts, paintings, textiles, and manuscripts and collections in Britain, Europe, and the United States, which collectively illustrate how the Tudors used art as a means to legitimize and glorify their rule. Their patronage of the arts rivaled the courts of Renaissance Europe and helped project a stable, majestic image and establish an artistic legacy that would endure for more than five centuries. 
Next slide, please. This is the entrance to the exhibition showing four iconic works of art to introduce the splendor of the Tudors. On the right, the famous Holbein composition of Henry VIII and all his power of majesty. And on the left, the beautiful Hilliard portrait of Elizabeth, Virgin Queen that we've just seen. And two sections from the unfinished tomb of Cardinal Wolsey, including the enormous candelabrum of over 13 feet high in the foreground and a pair of kneeling angels in the background, which have been brought together for the first time since the 16th 50s. Next slide, please. So what is different about the presentation of Tudors in San Francisco? For the Met presentation, it was like the catalogue organised by theme. But for us in San Francisco, the exhibition is arranged chronologically and by monarch. This suited the more intimate nature of our galleries and allowed the opportunity to see the progression of English art and history during the Tudor period. We begin at the top right on the plan here with Henry VII, the founder of the Tudor dynasty. Henry Tudor had only a distant and unlikely claim to the throne of England, being the son of a minor Welsh courtier and, uh, and his mother uh, being Lady Margaret Beaufort, who had a faint and illegitimate descent from the Plantagenet kings. It was Lady Margaret Beaufort's drive and ambition that paved the way for Henry's attempt to grab the throne from the legitimate Plantagenet king, Richard III. Henry Tudor's success in 1485 at the Battle of Bosworth landed him the throne and he set about making England stable and financially secure. Henry was, by character, exceptionally uh, frugal, except when it, he felt he had to employ magnificence to demonstrate his power and authority. Next slide, please. And this is Henry's most remarkable building, the Lady Chapel, also known as the Henry VII Chapel at Westminster Abbey, constructed essentially as a mausoleum for the Tudors. It was to be the most spectacular and flamboyant late Gothic structure built in England with intricate flan, uh, fan vaulting and an amazing airiness and delicacy. On the right is Henry's tomb by the Italian Renaissance sculptor Torrigiano, who was brought from Florence to work on this project. Set within a Gothic grille, reflecting the design of the chapel, this astonishing discovery inlaid is a spectacular high Renaissance tomb composed of um, classical figures of richly gilded bronze around the effigies. Next slide, please. In the next gallery, we're concerned with young Henry VIII. Henry was charismatic, athletic, intellectual, uh, and ambitious, and he was, essential, he was the quintessential Renaissance prince. He inherited a stable kingdom and a full treasury, and he spent lavishly on new palaces and treasures to fill them. More confident than his father, Henry sought to rival his more powerful counterparts in France and Spain. He raised the English court to a new level of sophistication, making it one of the most splendid academic and cosmopolitan in Europe. And in this view of the gallery, early Henry gallery, we can see the spectacular gilded armor made for Henry in his newly established Greenwich armor workshops. And you can get here a sense of Henry's presence uh, of uh, in his over six foot one height in this armor, uh, which is set in front of a rich cloth of gold uh, and velvet, the sort of wildly expensive textile that Henry VIII and the Tudors used to emphasize their status. Next slide, please. The 
the most magnificent spectacle of Henry's reign was this meeting between Henry and his rival, Francis I of France. In June 1520, near Calais in northern France, the last English stronghold on French soil. Ostensibly to forge a lasting peace between the two kingdoms, these two kings vied with each other to be more magnificent than the other. In this view, we can see Henry at the bottom left with his huge red retinue, uh, the temporary banqueting house uh, in, on the right foreground, and behind are Francis's tents made of cloth of gold, which gave the event its name. The jousts were held in the top right, and the royal women dine in a tent on the extreme right, below the massive bread oven in the middle ground there. No lasting peace came out of this extravagant event. Next slide, please. The next gallery is of Henry VIII's later and turbulent reign, made famous by his break with the Roman Catholic Church and his numerous marriages. What we see here is the Psalter or Book of Psalms that belonged to Henry and depicts him in the guise of King David uh, playing a lyre in his chamber with his uh, court jester, uh, Will Summers, right beside him in the Tudor green uh, livery. Next slide, please. So the big uh, question for Henry VIII that created all the uh, difficulties of the, uh, his break with Rome was his search for a male heir. And finally, he, this was achieved uh, with Edward, uh, later Edward VI. And the next section deals with both of Henry's successors, who ruled very briefly for five, six and five years respectively. So Henry's long-for son and heir, Edward VI, inherited the throne at the age of nine in 1547. A Regency Council governed in the king's name until he came of age. Edward's tutors had indoctrinated him with Protestant beliefs before he could complete his religious form. reforms. However, he died of tuberculosis in 1553 at the age of 16. Next slide, please. Mary I was England's first acknowledged Queen Regnant, meaning that she was the first woman to rule in her own right in England. She had a hard and difficult life after the divorce of her mother from Henry VIII, being exiled from court and losing her status as princess but she remained a staunch Roman Catholic and had spent her short five-year reign in reinstating the Catholic Church's authority wherever possible. She's most notorious for burning 283 Protestants at the stake for heresy, earning her uh, the title Bloody Mary. Mary married her cousin, Philip of Spain, who was appointed king consul, but the marriage was very unpopular in England and the association with Spain lost Calais to the French, the last English possession in France. Next slide, please. So the next section concerns the early part of Elizabeth's reign. Elizabeth I, daughter of Henry VIII and his second wife, Anne Boleyn, was at the onset of her reign a Protestant queen encircled by powerful Catholic opponents who regarded her as illegitimate. To bridge the divisions wrought by her predecessors, she pursued a moderate path to uh, establish a clear Anglican faith and a limited degree of tolerance. Elizabeth was a shrewd stateswoman who kept her courtiers and foreign emissaries on their toes, famously using the prospect of marriage to negotiate with hopeful princes across Europe. Elizabeth's court regained some of the glamour and exuberance lost during her siblings' more severe reigns, 
the queen and her courtiers furnished themselves with fashionable luxuries and the exchange of precious gifts was a means of currying royal favour. Next slide, please. So the most dramatic moment in Elizabeth's reign was the attempted invasion of England by a massive fleet of Spanish ships sent in 1588 by her former brother-in-law Philip of Spain to overthrow Elizabeth and re-establish the uh, Roman Catholic faith in England. The attempt by the Spanish failed despite their larger numbers and superior ships, uh, ships and the event was deemed the greatest victory in Elizabeth's reign these prints show the engagements of the two fleets. The prints were made after a series of tapestries that were woven to commemorate the English victory by the Lord High Admiral, and they were um, uh, uh, later uh, owned and uh, put into the House of Lords. But the, the unfortunately, burnt, these are the only records that survive. Next slide, please. So following England's victory over Spain after the, uh, uh, after the failed invasion of 1588, Eng Elizabeth's later reign was a period of relative peace and stability. England emerged as a naval and mercantile power with few friends in Catholic Europe. Elizabeth established diplomatic relations with Russia, the Ottoman Empire and Morocco. English art and architecture literature and drama matured away from European Renaissance standards, reflected in the distinctive style of Elizabeth's court. Unmarried, Elizabeth cultivated the image of a virgin deity wed to the English people, appearing in voluminous, heavy, heavily ornamented costumes and hairstyles uh, with her face and age concealed by white lead paint. Elizabeth's reign, the last of the Tudor dynasty, was regarded by subsequent gen generation as a golden age. And you can see the gallery dominated by a large portrait of Elizabeth in the last years of her reign, the so-called Hardwick portrait. Next slide, please. So the Tudor's exhibition expands beyond the lower level exhibition galleries to include a display of Tudor tapestries in the upper level gallery one, where their large size could be better accommodated. Next slide. So tapestries were the glory of Tudor palaces. During the 16th century, Brussels in present day Belgium was the major center of uh, tapestry production. Tapestries were often made in sets and subject matter included hunting scenes, landscapes and battles, as well as biblical uh, scenes that we can see here or allegorical scenes. Tapestries were the principal demonstration of a kingly presence, hung in the public galleries of a palace when the monarch was in residence. Tapestries not only insulated cold stone interiors, but they also decorated the walls with their rich, bright colours and with a sparkle of gold and silver thread. Henry VII invested in ta tapestries of a, as a means of conveying kingly splendour, but while Henry VIII was particularly notable collector with nearly 2,500 tapestries inventoried at the time of his death in 1547. So that concludes the overview and Thomas will now take us to the next section. Thank you very much, Martin, and good evening again to our audience. And once again, my name is Thomas Wu, and an aspect of the exhibition that I would like to examine more deeply is the cosmopolitanism of Tudor court culture and English material culture more broadly during the 16th century. As Martin has shown, the exhibition traces the evolution of English artistic production and consumption over the course of the Tudor period from 1485 to 1603. 
The reign of the Tudors, despite the social unrest wrought by shifting religious policies, brought relative peace, stability, and prosperity to England after the Wars of the Roses, and England grew increasingly confident, ambitious, and important in European affairs, as well as increasingly outward looking. The early Tudor monarchs, Henry VII and Henry VIII, sought to bring the culture of the English court up to speed with the European Renaissance as befitting a first-rate royal house. At the same time, Portugal established maritime trade routes as well as colonial outposts up and down the coasts of Africa and Asia during the late 15th and 16th centuries, which indirectly increased England's exposure and access to luxury goods from farther afield. The exhibition contains a number of objects that particularly illustrate how these two developments shaped England's evolving relationships with Europe and the wider world. These objects can be divided into three main categories. One, luxury goods that were imported into England from Europe. Two, works that were produced in England by continental artists and craftspeople. And three, objects that incorporate luxury materials from beyond Europe. I will very briefly present a couple of highlights from each of these categories. The first category then is luxury goods that were imported into England from Europe. Within the exhibition, these include textiles and furniture. As Martin explained, Henry VII was essentially a usurper with a dubious claim to the throne and his mission was to convince both the English nobility and the emissaries of other European monarchs that his kingship and dynasty were legitimate and permanent. Henry VIII, who inherited a stable kingdom and a full treasury from his father in 1509, had a different mission, to rival his continental counterparts and make his court a major center of Renaissance culture and learning, equal to or surpassing the grandest courts of Europe. Two types of luxury textile, cloth of gold and tapestry, played a significant role in furthering the missions of these two kings. The most luxurious textile available during the Tudor period was cloth of gold, a fabric woven of silk or wool threads wrapped in gold. Since the Middle Ages, cloth of gold had been worn by the clergy as well as royalty for solemn occasions like coronations. As such, it demonstrated not only wealth, but also status and authority. Italian city-states, such as Florence, Lucca, Genoa, and Venice, were the major centers of cloth of gold weaving during the 15th and 16th centuries. There are two examples of cloth of gold in the exhibition. The first is a cope or clerical vestment, one of a large set that Henry VII commissioned from weavers in Florence and Lucca, for the clergy at Westminster Abbey. A cloth of gold surface is decorated with thorny vines and roses in red silk velvet, emblematic of the House of Lancaster, from which Henry VII descended, as well as crowned portcullises or drawbridge gates worked in silver thread, the emblem of Henry VII's mother's family, the Beauforts. The copes would have demonstrated the wealth and generosity befitting a king while also visually reaffirming the cooperation of crown and church and the latter's public endorsement of the former. The second example of Italian velvet cloth of gold in the exhibition shown on the right is a furnishing textile. The date of this piece is unknown for certain. Um, it may have come from the early reign of Henry VIII after 1509, or it may date earlier to Henry VII's reign. But cloth of gold um, throughout that period was often hung behind or over a throne as a canopy of state designating the sovereign's authority while holding court. Throughout the Tudor period, the court moved frequently between palaces to allow for cleaning and to avoid outbreaks of infection. Furniture, silver, and wall hangings traveled with the court, and a cloth of gold hanging like this would have provided a suitably regal backdrop wherever the monarch might be even at short notice. Tapestries were an even more splendid type of textile that the Tudor monarchs imported. 
Tapestry is a loom woven textile made with dyed wool threads. The most luxurious tapestries were also woven with silk threads and threads wrapped in gold or silver. The finest tapestry weavers of the 15th and 16th centuries were to be found in the region of Flanders in modern day Belgium, and particularly the city of Brussels. Due to the high cost of dyes and the quantities of silk and precious metals that went into tapestries, they were the single most expensive artistic luxury available and the ultimate statement of wealth. Some sets of tapestries could cost more than a warship. Henry VII, although notoriously frugal, as Martin has said, did invest in artistic luxuries like tapestries to project appropriately kingly splendor. But Henry VIII was one of the most prodigious collectors of tapestries in Europe. At the time of his death in 1547, 2,450 tapestries were listed in his inventory. Although the colors of most 16th century tapestries have faded with time and light exposure, they would have lined the walls of Henry's palaces with vibrant jewel-toned reds, blues, and greens, as well as the glint of gold and silver. An especially good example of this is the tapestry shown on the left, titled St. Paul directing the burning of the books, from a set depicting the life of St. Paul. If you look at the plume of smoke billowing from the pile of burning books in the center, you'll note that it appears oddly blank and dull amidst the colors, but this would originally have been shining silver that has tarnished with age and a focal point of the composition. In addition to their sheer beauty, tapestries were also an effective means of displaying allegorical imagery on a large scale. Biblical narratives like the life of St. Paul were a common subject of tapestry sets. The example shown on the right is from a set of 10 tapestries illustrating the story of David and Bathsheba and depicts an episode titled The Division of the Booty or Loot. Henry VIII acquired multiple David themed sets and may have wished to identify visually with the biblical king. The richness and imagery of Flemish tapestries and Italian cloth of gold would have aided Henry VII with his aim of projecting a strong, stable, legitimate reign, as well as Henry VIII's desire to raise the English court to a new level of magnificence, beauty, and sophistication, matching that of any court in Europe. Beyond the royal household, the English nobility likewise had an appetite for European luxuries with which to decorate their great houses. Fast forwarding to the reign of Elizabeth I during the second half of the 16th century, an outstanding example in the exhibition is a French table called the Sea Dog Table, in reference to the four legendary beasts functioning as legs. During the 16th century, Henry VIII's great rival, Francis I of France, as well as his son Henry II and his Italian queen Catherine de' Medici, brought numerous artists and craftspeople from Italy to work in France and adorn the French royal palaces. The result was a distinctly Italianate French Renaissance style. The Sea Dog Table was made in Paris around 1570 to 1575, following a design by Jacques de Sercoux, one of the royal architects who introduced Renaissance architecture to France. It is made of walnut inlaid with fruit wood, tulip wood, and marble specimens. The carved ornament incorporates motifs from classical architecture, while the four sea dogs have dogs' heads, human breasts, front legs with paws, and the lower bodies of fish with scales. The table was purchased in the 1570s by George Talbot, 6th Earl of Shrewsbury, for his country seat at Chatsworth House. During divorce proceedings between the Earl and his wife, Bess of Hardwick, one of the Queen's principal ladies-in-waiting, she claimed the table as part of her settlement and moved it to her new home at Hardwick Hall, one of the great surviving Elizabethan country houses. We see from this table then that Renaissance influence not only permeated the royal court, but also the houses of the nobility. A second group of objects that can be discerned in the exhibition includes works of art made by continental artists and craftspeople in England. Henry VIII's generous patronage with the aim of elevating the English court attracted artists from across Europe, and this preference for continental artists continued through the reigns of Edward VI and Mary I. This resulted in a series of European court portraitists, including the Italian sculptor Pietro Torrigiano, 
Henry's court painter Hans Holbein the Younger from Germany, Edward's Dutch court painter William Scott, and the Flemish painters Hans Urich and Antonis Moore, who produced portraits of Mary. Martin and I will discuss some of these paintings together later in the presentation, so for now I will highlight an, a gold medal in the exhibition depicting Mary I, made by the Milanese metal sculptor Jacopo da Trezzo. In 1554, Mary married her maternal cousin Philip of Spain, who summoned da Trezzo to England to commemorate their marriage. As Philip's wife, Mary was not only Queen of England in her own right, but Queen Consort of Naples and, after 1556, Queen Consort of Spain. Through her marriage into the supremely powerful Habsburgs, Mary gained access to the finest European artists of the day. On one side of the medal, we see Mary's profile, and on the reverse, we see Mary as the personification of peace. The medal depicts its subject with astonishing accuracy and detail, and its format was modeled after ancient Roman precedents and embodies the classical aesthetics of the Renaissance. Medals were also an important means of disseminating a monarch's image, as they could be cast in multiples as well as in different medals of varying value. Beyond the palace walls, London was a thriving center of European commerce. The shipyards bustled with foreign merchants from the German Hanseatic League, the Netherlands, and Portugal. By the reign of Elizabeth I, there was a substantial foreign population in London, including many artisans and craftspeople. One object in the exhibition that was drawn from the Fine Arts Museum's permanent collection is a goblet made by the Venetian glassmaker Jacopo or Giacomo Verzellini. At the beginning of the 16th century, the production of glass was monopolized by the Republic of Venice. Later in the century, to curtail the expense of importing this coveted luxury, various rulers invited Venetian glassmakers to establish workshops in their territories. In 1575, Elizabeth granted Vercellini the exclusive right to produce Venetian-style glass in London. The presence of foreign craftspeople in London would have made their wares, wares available not only to the royal court and the nobility, but to wealthy Londoners more widely. And this leads me to a final group of objects that can be identified within the exhibition, works that incorporate materials imported into England from beyond Europe. While England was just beginning to expand its maritime trade capabilities during the Tudor period, by the 16th century, Portugal had established a robust maritime network, including various points in Africa, Asia, and South America, and imported luxury wares such as silk and porcelain into Europe. This cup on the left, a rare surviving piece of Chinese porcelain that entered England during the 16th century, likely traveled to Europe in a Portuguese ship. The exterior of the cup has a rare red ground, while the interior is more typical blue and white. It was likely made by, at the Ming Dynasty porcelain kilns at Jingdezhan. The silver mounts made by Athelal Partridge, who served as goldsmith to both Mary and Elizabeth, can be regarded as a form of framing the porcelain as a rare and precious specimen. Prior to the 18th century, the secret of making porcelain was a mystery to Europeans, and imported Asian ceramics were prized for their delicacy, impermeability, and rarity. The custom of mounting porcelain with decorative silver or gilt bronze would continue through the 18th century. And the last object in the exhibition that I will highlight it's a silver cup mounted with mother of pearl plaques made in the Gujarat region of Western India. Like Chinese porcelain, these mother of pearl plaques would have entered England through Portuguese trade networks, which included colonial outposts in India. The mother of pearl likely arrived in London in the form of a finished cup, which was then dismantled carefully and incorporated into this silver vessel decorated with Tudor roses. Precious materials like mother of pearl and porcelain were coveted luxuries imported into Europe at tremendous expense, and it was the desire to trade more directly with Asia and other regions beyond Europe, rather than acquire commodities from a middleman like Portugal, that, is, that inspired the English, Dutch, and other European nations to develop their maritime capabilities and expand. During the 17th century, the Dutch would eclipse the Spanish and Portuguese as the dominant maritime traders only to be eclipsed during the 18th century by the British. 
I think what we see over the course of the exhibition is England growing culturally closer to Renaissance Europe from the onset of Henry VII's reign through the reign of Mary I. England was then more isolated from Catholic Europe during the reign of Elizabeth I, and English art seems to have moved in a more uniquely English direction. But at the same time, all of Europe, including England, was increasingly exposed to luxuries from beyond Europe during the 16th century, and it was this exposure and the desire to control trade more directly that motivated England's maritime expansion during the centuries that followed and ultimately gave rise to the supremely powerful British Empire. And now Martin and I will look at a few additional highlights together and provide a bit of commentary on them before taking questions from the audience. Thank you. I, so this, the first object is really the most spectacular object at the beginning of the show, which I mentioned earlier, is over 13 feet high. This candelabrum from the, uh, uh, originally made for the tomb of uh, Cardinal Wolsey that was not uh, um, uh, achieved because of his fall is absolutely spectacular object uh, in a, High Renaissance style by Benedetto uh, Rovazzano from Florence, using um, a series of classical uh, forms, vases, and balusters, acanthus leaf gudruning piled up on top of each other. A really spectacular object. And in this detail on the right, you can see Henry VIII's um, arms and his supporters, and above a row of Tudor roses. So although this object is engraved with the arms of Cardinal Wolsey and was evidently made for him originally, as soon as he fell in 1529, Henry VIII took it over and must have had this section introduced with, um, with Henry's arms and symbols to make it quite clear as to who it was made for. We've got any comments about that. So uh, what do you think about uh, these uh, uh, figures of angels, um, Thomas? Well, I think that it is difficult when looking at them in the exhibition in isolation displayed as art objects to see them as part of a much larger structure, which is shown in this very helpful um, diagram on the right, but shows what the completed tomb would have looked like. Um, to provide a bit of context, um, Cardinal Wolsey was Henry VIII's chief advisor during the early part of his reign, um, when Henry was was young and, and idealistic, and um, he would frequently leave the business of state to Wolsey. Um, but Wolsey also amassed as much as he was Henry VIII's modest servant, he amassed a considerable fortune. He initiated the construction of palaces um, that Henry would later appropriate, Hampton Court and Whitehall Palace. Um, and this tomb is really a testament to, to Wolsey's wealth and power, even though he, he fell from grace and, and never, it never came to fruition. Good. Well, I think it's fascinating to see these objects brought together for the first time in 400 years. The um, These angels, which have a tremendous softness and humanity about them, um, are were discovered on top of a gatepost in England uh, about um, 15, uh, 20 years ago, and now belong to the Victorian Albert Museum, an extraordinary discovery from this lost project that was lost to Wolsey and then uh, was lost to Henry VIII. It's rather extraordinary that Henry, VIII, Henry VIII, such a giant figure in English history, should have no tomb. And it was only uh, in the 19th century that the place he was buried in St. George's Chapel was engraved with his name. Next slide. So here he is, Henry in all his full magnificence, 
making a big statement about who he is with his uh, extraordinary costume. His shoulders look enormously wide. Um, and this is such a clever uh, portrait uh, made by Holbein, a likeness of the king, but also a, a propaganda portrait that was meant to um, uh, convey power, majesty, and stability, and richness at the very moment that Henry was undergoing all kinds of difficulties due to his policies, um, the split with Rome, and then uh, his successive marriages. This portrait, uh, which comes from the National Gallery in Rome, um, were, is dated uh, 1540 at the time of his marriage to Anne of Cleves. Have you got something to say about it, Thomas? Well, I think looking at Hans Holbein's portraiture within, within its place in the history of art, we can see Holbein's use of techniques that ultimately originate in the Italian Renaissance, like chiaroscuro, or very subtle shading to convey the contours of Henry's face with this photographic believability. Um, and what I find so extraordinary when looking at Henry's face is that Holbein does not resort to using lines to delineate Henry's features at all. Every facet of his face is, is completely rounded and smooth. And I think that's where the believability comes from. But then at the same time, um, if we look at Henry's incredible costume with different fabrics and jewels, we see Northern Renaissance influence um, in that the Northern Renaissance emphasized minute attention to detail um, in a more static way. And, and I think that Holbein combines these elements to produce this incredibly convincing uh, portrait. Well, we're lucky to have so many great Holbeins in this show, and he, it really shows that he was one of the greatest portraitists in the uh, 16th century, and the Tudors were very lucky to have him, and Henry VIII in particular. So let's look at the next object. Well, Thomas, do you want to talk about this? Um, because it's such an important um, tapestry, um, which has been... Um, uh, represents Henry the Seventh's um, collecting of tapestries. Yes, well, as I mentioned earlier, um, Henry the Seventh, although he was was very frugal and tried to avoid um, expenditures in order to build a solid foundation for his dynasty, did recognize the importance of artistic luxuries as a means of. Um, impressing his subjects as well as the the foreign monarchs that he was trying to um, convince of his legitimacy. He was also very keen to arrange marriages between um, his own children and foreign royals. So he did want a splendid court. And this is one of the tapestries um, from Henry VII's reign, um, depicting God's creation of the world and of man. Um, as, as described in the book of Genesis. And we see discrete episodes depicting um, the different um, steps that God took toward creating the world. And in the lower right-hand corner, we see um, Adam and Eve being expelled uh, from Eden. And Martin, would you like to add anything? Well, I, it's, it's a spectacular tapestry. It's some 24 feet wide, some 13 feet high. Um, and it is the pres presence of uh, pristine gold and silver that really makes this a remarkable survival. And you can see the freshness of the color in this um, a tapestry. It really is the finest quality of tapestry. And it shows how Henry VII could really push the boat out when he needed to. So next, this, this is an extraordinary object. Um, uh, as uh, uh, the Bishop of Rochester, um, Bishop Fisher, captured by the Florentine sculptor Pietro Torrigiano, um, 
who had come to work on the tombs in uh, Westminster Abbey. And he's managed to portray a very humble and even austere man, but we have an extraordinary intensity of um, expression in Fisher's face that reflects who he was as an intellectual, um, but also as a very um, humble human being. It has a great stillness to it, and someone has described this as being having the intensity of uh, portrayal that you that Holbein would find twenty years later. So it's a very interesting connection when um, seen in that way between sculpture in portraiture, and this is of course in terracotta and in painting. Yes, and I agree that it is it is an interesting way to look at this sculpture as the the sculptural answer to Holbein's portraiture later in the Tudor period. Um, perhaps to provide a bit more context about the subject of the portrait, um, John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, was um, a theologian and a, a conservative Catholic clergyman. He was the confessor to Lady Margaret Beaufort, Henry VII's mother, as well as the executor of her will. And then later, during Henry VIII's protracted divorce proceedings against Catherine of Aragon, um, Fisher served as Catherine's lawyer and refused Henry's requirement um, that all subjects assign the oath, uh, acknowledging him as supreme head of the church um, and acknowledging the marriage as illegitimate. And ultimately, um, Fisher would pay for it with his life. Um, prior to his death, the Pope appointed him a cardinal of the church, and Henry uh, allegedly replied to this that he would send Fisher's head to Rome to receive his cardinal's cap. So it's interesting, it's interesting in a sense for us to look at this bust which depicts Fisher from um, below the shoulders up when eventually he would lose his head like so many um, so many of the, the um, prominent figures of Tudor England. Now let's look at the next object. Well, these are objects that uh, are from our, our own collection, and it's the first time they've been out on view uh, while they've been uh, belong to the museum since the 1980s. And they are traditional looking uh, pieces of panelling on first glance um, with late medieval or late Gothic ornament of um, uh, 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 ribs uh, back to each other. Um, and uh, um, they, uh, however, contain some panels that show how the Renaissance could come even to the most obscure and deepest part of rural Kent in England. And these two panels, that uh, two of the panels that are shown in detail on the right show, um, uh, heads, antique heads in rundles, um, very much taken after the after um, the uh, antique precedence. The one at the top is of an African head, the one below of a Roman head. Um, and the, it is extraordinary to see this uh, appearing in Kent so early on. But the owner of this um, house, Borton Place, um, rose in uh, the Tudor court to become a man of some prominence. But at this time, in the 1520s and 30s, he was um, building his uh, credibility at court and became treasurer of Calais across the channel. Um, and here uh, he's managed in this, uh, the panelling is for a family room uh, where they would gather to be comfortable because the panelling would uh, uh, insulate uh, these co cold stone walls and there was a fireplace in this room. So it really reflects how the Renaissance would come even to a provincial manor house. And shall I show the next slide with an image? Yeah. Oh yes, this is the context for it. And I was in 
Kent uh, recently, and uh, we didn't have much in the way of image of the outside of Boughton Place, but here it is, um, by walking along a farmer's field and holding a um, a camera high up above my shoulders, I was able to capture uh, the um, <clears throat> southern elevation of Borton Place with the large oriel window, which was for the Great Hall. This is where the panelling was not. The panelling was in the room just to the right, but this is the context uh, for uh, the panelling I've just shown you. Next slide. And I think we are now at 10 minutes of the hour, so perhaps we'll look okay. at the object and then we will leave a few minutes for questions. But we should certainly include this incredible portrait of Jane Seymour, who was Henry III's third wife, um, following Anne Boleyn, and was the mother of his son, Edward VI. Um, although she tragically died very shortly after giving birth of childbed fever. Um, I think that this image of Jane is particularly interesting in that long after Jane passed away, um, in any future portraits of the Tudor dynasty, she would be depicted with Henry and Edward. Um, this was really the wife who Henry wanted to be remembered in posterity. Um, and it is an incredible um, example of Holbein's use of the same techniques that he used um, for Henry VIII's portrait um, to achieve a highly believable, um, detailed, and, and almost photographic image. And Martin, would you like to say anything? Yeah, it is. It's an extraordinary intensity. I mean, she does look a bit grim, it has to be said. Um, but uh, maybe she was nervous. I mean, being married to a monster like that, anybody would feel a bit um, perhaps cowed by it. She is portrayed rather curiously with a gable hood or headdress, um, which was old fashioned by this date. And maybe she's making a statement about her conservative um, nature, that she was a Catholic, but also um, a distinct, um, a distinctly in opposition to Anne Boleyn's adoption of the more flattering curved French hood. Um, the, she's wearing the jewels that Henry gave her on their marriage uh, around her, the, the edge of her bodice, um, around the edge of her hood, and of course as neck, uh, necklaces, and that is the most beautiful details of the uh, texture uh, of the velvet and the cloth of silver sleeves. Um, to this uh, painting. It, we are so lucky that Kunsthistorisches has lent this beautiful painting to our showing of this exhibition. We're very, very grateful. And maybe one so now of... we're going to look at questions, are we? Yes. So let me stop sharing my screen and we'll yeah. turn to questions. The first question is, how long did it take to complete tapestries? It seems like it would take a long time. That is a good question. And I'm afraid I don't know the precise amount of time that it would have taken. Um, it would have been a very laborious process involving multiple um, craftspeople in a larger workshop. Um, the, uh, the loom, on which a tapestry was woven would have been rather complex as well. There would have been a drawing um, or a design uh, called a cartoon that would be beneath the loom and the weavers would then trace that design um, in thread. And the Absolutely, next it would it would have taken a long time, and it uh, of course at vast. These are the most expensive works of art made at this time. Not paintings, not even jewelry. It is tapestries of the most expensive works of art. Yes. The next question: Were these spectacular tapestries handed down from royal family to family? How can they be in such pristine condition? In some cases, yes. And I think in the, uh, uh, the survival of tapestries in Spain, in the Spanish royal collections, is something which has attracted a lot of attention from our director, 
Thomas P. Campbell because they have survived in such pristine condition because they were um, stored, rolled up and stored. Um, by contrast, the Abraham series of tapestries that are hung at Hampton Court have been hung more or less uh, 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 um, constantly since the 16th century. But it's amazing they su have survived at all, given um, that uh, them being subjected to uh, light and the extraordinary weight of the tapestry, uh, the threads have to take a lot of um, stress. So in, in the case of the uh, Spanish royal collections, there are amazing tapestries. Of course, the French royal collections don't survive. They use uh, the terrible accounts during the French Revolution of them burning the tapestries to try and get the tiny amounts of gold and silver thread, it's gold and silver out of the threads. Yes. And question number three, switching to paintings. These fabulous original portraits of Henry VII and Elizabeth, I think Henry VIII, are the frames original? Did they stay in the succeeding royal family's collection? That's a good question. I do not know if the frames are um, probably not original, but but they are historical. Only rarely, only rarely are they original. But in the exhibition, uh, we have the Hardwick portrait is in its original frame, which has a large uh, egg and dart frame, which is part of the um, um, uh, part of the decoration of Hardwick Hall. I think that the other frames, it's hard to think of another frame, which is the original, uh, uh, strikes one as the original frame. And question number four, can you speak to the workrooms that were required to create the spectacular costumes and regalia worn by both sexes of Tudor rulers? Well, well the I'm... only, Ooh, yeah, oh, please go ahead. I was only going to say that um, I'm not sure about individual components, but I think we can say that given how complex Tudor costumes were, there probably would have been different craftspeople who would have contributed to them. Um, jewelers would have produced jewelry, which would then have been attached to the textile components. Um, we also see um, use of fur in a number of um, portraits as well, and that would have been created by separate, by separate craftspeople. And, they're, and of course, they're specialist importers, people who are specialized in importing uh, these uh, uh, unbelievably expensive uh, textiles from Europe, and particularly Florence and Luca, for, we saw for the Cope, uh, uh, which uh, was earlier. And it, that did t take some time. Um, in fact, it was so um, it's so laborious and so complex that, that more several workshops were involved in producing those coats. Yes. And then the fifth question is, can you comment on the portrait of Edward VI and the comment in Latin of Alter Ego? And I, I can't remember whether this um, Latin inscription is on the um, portrait of Edward VI as a child or um, as an adult painted by William Scrotts, but the the inscription on the adult portrait um, describes how the um, flowers depicted in the left-hand side of the composition are growing toward Edward as the king, rather than to the sun, which is depicted directly above them. Um, I can't remember any more detail than that about what the text says, but then um, above the Holbein portrait of Edward as a child that we didn't quite get to, um, there is a quote saying in Latin, um, to young Edward, if you hope to be um, a, a good king, um, look no further than the example of your father, or something to that effect. Which is rather extraordinary when you think of our view of Henry VIII today. <clears throat> uh, next question. The sixth question is, out of curiosity, why is there no mention of Jane Grey in the exhibition? That's a good question. I think because she nine was... days, queen. Yeah. <laughs> she wasn't really queen long enough to um, have have had much artistic production during her her brief reign, and most historians don't consider her to have been truly 
uh, Queen of England, unfortunately. But yeah, I think you... it's I think it's yeah it's it, it's because she uh, there are no works of art that we know that were associated with her. It's not because she wasn't significant. She is an int very interesting figure, but it's the fact that there isn't uh, anything that we that we know of that is uh, associated with her. And of course, in that short period, she didn't have time to uh, commission uh, great works of art. And maybe we have time for one more question. Oh, this is an interesting question. Was the silver thread meant to be polished on the tapestry or was it meant to become tarnished? Hmm, I think it wasn't meant to become tarnished, but how that would have been prevented, I can't imagine. I think in the case of the burning of the books, that, that amazing cloud, which is made out of silver threads, I think that the, you know, the threads are, are uh, textured in such a way to indicate the billowing of the clouds, but they would look very different if the silver was clean. And uh, so I think that the intention was the silver was clean. I don't know how on earth they would expect to keep the silver clean if you consider a tapestry hung in uh, rooms where there were open fires that would tarnish the silver all too quickly, never mind the cold, damp winters. And I think we are a minute over time. And so I, I would like to thank um, the audience again for joining us for this program. Um, it's been a tremendous pleasure um, and it was certainly a pleasure to work on the exhibition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Good evening.